Uh, I'm going to uh, give you a... Oh, so where's the clicker? There is the clicker. Uh, so this is the book. Got very famous. That's the one thing you can say. Uh, and and uh, it started the growth debate, uh, and it did not manage to stop the growth debate, you know, by saying that sustainable development is the only solution. Uh, uh, the sound man, can I do like this without... Huh? Oh, I see, so I can take it away. Oh, fabulous. Then I can even read or see. Uh, uh, beautiful. Uh, I'm having, I'm doing a structured presentation because otherwise, as you know, I can speak endlessly about anything. Uh, so what I'm going to do, that's stupid that the thing is too high, but okay. So I'm going to answer five questions, six, well, I'm going to answer five questions and then I'm going to make one statement. Uh, so first, what did the limits to growth actually say? Secondly, what has happened during the last 50 years? Third, what will happen during the next 50 years? Four, will there be global collapse? Which is, of course, one of the central concepts in all of this. And f five, how can we stop the decline in well-being, which I forecast over the next 50 years? And then, uh, after having presented the solution, I'll conclude and saying that this is difficult, particularly in liberal uh, democratic societies, and uh, it is still doable in principle. So, question number one. What did the limits to growth say? So, 50 years ago, my friends and I wrote this little book. Uh, and the little book contained 12 scenarios. Sorry, I should say one other thing. I'm using a number of graphs in this presentation. For those of you who like graphs like the one here, enjoy it. You know, for those who hate graphs, which is 90% of any audience, listen to what I say. You know, I'm not going to point to them or anything. They're just there for those of you who, are, who like uh, dynamics of systems and follow things over time. There's always time along the horizontal axis, you know, in these uh, graphs. So, uh, the limits to growth contained 12 scenarios for world development from 1970 to the year 2100. Six of the scenarios of the Limits to Growth book were sad scenarios where something went wrong in the 21st century. Either there was too little food or too little resources or too much pollution or too many people. Something physically went wrong, thereby you know, making happiness and populations in extreme case decline. So they look like this, the red line, you know, being the population disappearing or at least halving itself, uh, declining in the second half of this century. Six of the scenarios of the limits to growth uh, were happier scenarios where humanity managed to achieve a certain degree of sustainability in the, in the uh, 21st century. The interesting thing, in 1972, when we published the book, we did not know enough to be able to tell which of the 12 scenarios was the most likely. And actually, science did not know at the time what, uh, which was the most likely. So the only thing we could do was to make the ob obvious recommendation that please, mankind, stay away from the collapse scenarios. You know, it's much better to try to shoot through and try to get into some level of sustainability. The concept didn't exist at the time, it was called equilibrium, which makes people hate us, but that's, uh, it's the same idea, trying to organize one planet living, trying to organize so that everyone has a relatively stable and happy life. So, uh, in order for those that have a hard time following, you know, so this is now the conclusion after the first five slides. This I've learned that that's a good idea to try to summarize for people what I'm trying to say. So what I'm basically saying is that the limits to growth was its main message was that it, it warned against the possibility of overshoot and collapse in the 21st century. It pointed to the fact that 
it is possible for humanity to increase its numbers and its physical impact, its resource use and its emissions in tons per year to such an extent that you are in non-sustainable territory. And then, you, once you are there, you can't stay there for hundreds of years, so you will be forced down either by the forces of nature or by managed decline. You know, that humanity decides, like the IPCC, that we are now going to try to draw down the annual damage that we're causing to the environment. The interesting thing, and I repeat this because at least for you 50 years later, it ought to be possible to understand that the, all the controversy um, between limits and the rest of the world, and particularly the economists, relate to the confusion about my second point there. You know, the limits of growth spoke about the growth in the human footprint measured in tons per year. This is the resource use, it's the destruction of the forest, it is the emissions of pollutants, etc. It did not talk about value, which is GDP. GDP is dollars per year. The GDP increases when I give very expensive talks in exchange for wonderful paintings. And we can give better and better talks, and we can make wonderfuler and wonderfuler uh, pictures. So GDP growth is totally irrelevant in the discussion of physical growth on a physically finite planet. This message we are not able to get through at all, even at this point in time when I discuss with my other 77-year-old economist friends of the you know, neoliberal uh, type of, uh, or neoclassical macro types, you know, they are unable to understand this difference between the physical reality and the monetized version of this thing. You know, formerly I thought it was our inability to communicate that was the problem. No, of course, I understand that we have the standard situation that if your income depends on you not understanding something, you will never understand that. And this goes for most of the people on the surface of the earth who are either in business or are short-term voters that would like you know, not to have to pay taxes, or if you are a macroeconomist, a professor at the University of Oslo you know, in the macroeconomics department. Oh, sorry, and now even in my school, I was not the director for one year. Actually, I survived eight years in this position. And now we have the most wonderful, old-fashioned financial economy and macroeconomics department also at my school. You know, teaching the wrong. <laughs> so that's good. And so I added the third, say, widely misinterpreted as speaking about growth in GDP, if people had understood what we said, the book would never have become famous. So we are, of course, grateful for the fact uh, that uh, it gave us fame. It didn't uh, you know, save the world, but uh, we got famous. Uh, then, question number two. What has happened since? And luckily now, uh, uh, there exists scientific literature which has tried to compare developments over the last 50 years with the scenarios of limits. So the most famous one by Gaia uh, Harrington, this wonderful lady uh, at Harvard, uh, she has taken four of the scenarios, of, chosen four of the 12, these are the uh, colored graphs, and then she has superposed on this in the white part, which is the, the part from 1990 onwards, you know, he, she has superposed the black dots, which is what actually has happened. And I'll show you five of these things. So this is for the population. Uh, so it says, it's okay, can you re read the top? Although it's half cut, so it says pop, fine. So basically the message is that we wrote the book where the gray stuff uh, basically stops and then uh, made the scenarios, which are the colored uh, graphs, and then you can afterwards have a look and see what happened to the actual population. And you see the actual population followed uh, 
the average of our scenarios very exactly. There were 3.5 billion people on the surface of the Earth when I gave my first talk. We passed 6 billion as forecast in the year 2000, and we are now at 7.9 billion. You know, so we have more than doubled while I've been speaking and speaking and speaking and speaking, and no one has listened except a few highly educated uh, and, uh, you know, women in, in uh, the rich countries. Actually, quite a few of the, of the... Because fertility rates are, of course, coming down like a stone all over the world. So, fine. So, population, yes, what has happened is that the world has followed the limits of the road. Then you do the same thing for industrial output, which was the closest measure to GDP in the model. And you see once more, the black line is essentially following the, the history this far. Of course, we still have the more exciting part of the future uh, to the right in the graph, and we haven't gotten there. You do the same thing with pollution. This is emissions. There are two types of emissions here. The, the one is on plastics, waste, and the lower one is on CO2 emissions. And again, you see the general idea that the world has followed the general idea of, of limits to growth. You take, you take resource use. This is the remaining amount of coal, oil, and gas in the world. It is going down, but we still have a huge amount of, of coal, oil, and gas, so resource crises uh, are not you know, a problem at this point in time. Uh, and then, interestingly, we even have a welfare index in at least the later editions of uh, the Limits book. And you see how the Human Development Index, in this case, has been growing, just like forecast in the uh, Limits to Growth book. And interestingly, with the stagnation, that, that's where you finally see some kind of a beginning of a problem in, in the aggregate data. Conclusion at this point in time is the following, the limits to growth has been surprisingly correct during the first 50 years. The world has overshot. You know, we are in non-sustainable uh, territory. Uh, and this is most best illustrated by, by the climate situation, where we are now, so we have increased emissions, you know, that to the extent that we're now emitting into the atmosphere, uh, twice as much uh, CO2 as is being absorbed every year in the oceans and in the forests of the world. That half, the remaining half, remains in the atmosphere, and as long as we keep doing this, the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere goes up, and when the concentration goes up, the temperature goes up. And this is going to continue not only until we stop growing the emissions. You know, we have to draw the emissions all the way down to zero before the concentration levels off. And so we are solidly in overshoot, but we have not yet seen collapse. You know, the world has not collapsed during the last 50 years, at least not a global collapse caused by environmental uh, reasons. So, that leads to the next interesting question. What will happen during the next 50 years? So, we know what happened during the first 50 years, what happens during the next 50. And this is what I have been working on for the last 10, 15 years. So the various books that Eric mentioned are reports written, or books written during the last you know, 12 years. I've, I think I've made four. Uh, talking about what will actually happen when you are so stupid that you don't listen to what Jorgen is saying. You know, that's the general idea. You know, the, so, uh, I don't think people will listen, and consequently it is possible to forecast what will happen. Of course, I don't want this to happen, but this is what I, as a scientist, believe will happen. Uh, and uh, so we are working now on the 50-year anniversary book. So we are making a new limits to growth book, a new computer model. You know what was interesting about uh, what was interesting about the limits to growth was that it was a model-based analysis. So it was a, had a quantitative uh, dynamic model as its core, as something that kept our thinking straight avoided 
inconsistencies uh, in the system. So we're now making a new one. Uh, and so in September, we will launch the 50-year anniversary book in umpteen countries at the same time as a book with model-based. We have been working on this for several years. Uh, here is uh, the new standard run. This is the, the most likely future, the way I see it. We call it too little too late because it is, of course, a scenario, and it is actually also what we would like to avoid. You know, so we will be happy if we are proven wrong. So what is going to happen? And I'll just talk uh, through some... These are five or six of the, call it, 200 variables that exist in the model system. So the model system is very much more complex than, than this seems to indicate. But then this is already beyond the capacity of most people to absorb. So what is going to happen on the population side? What will happen in our view is that the population is going to continue growing, but it will peak around 2050. So already in 20 years, we will see the population starting to decline. It will not decline because of lack of food or because of pollution. It is going to decline because richer women have fewer children. So the continued GDP expansion is going to you know, solve the, the, the population problem for us. Uh, on the GDP side, on the economic activity side, we will see continued growth in value you know, over this, uh, this period, uh, but at a slower rate, because it is observed and scientifically provable that the growth rate of economies decline as they get richer, as more and more of the labor force moves from agriculture, manufacturing, construction, into administration and then into care, the rate of labor productivity growth slows. And this turns, that, that's what's seen that the United States grows at half a percent a year, you know, being the richest thing. Europe, perhaps 1%. China, still at 4 or 5. You know, they were at 10 or 7 in the past when they were really poor. And so this shift is going to happen in the world, which means that the long-term GDP growth rate is going to decline. Still, the GDP per person is going to go up, the blue line. And so people at the end of the century are going to be roughly as rich as uh, a half of us. You know, so it's... it's uh, we are, Norway is, of course, extreme in, in, in this case. Uh, the uh, third thing I want to point to is the, is the uh, gray line. This is the inequality. So this is the income of the rich divided by the income of the poor. And also it's a Palma ratio. And inequality has increased in general over the last 40 years, uh, the left-hand part of the thing, and it is going to continue in the most likely scenario because of continued liberalization. You know, this is the you know, weakening of the unions and the weakening of the state, the lowering of uh, taxes, is what causes inequality to continue to, to rise in this uh, system. Uh, and then uh, the fourth thing I wanted to mention is that energy use will, of course, increase because you have more people and more uh, activity. But we will see the shift from fossil energy towards renewables. And that thing is happening. It is, however, as you can see from the black line, it's not happening fast enough to avoid warming continuing. And in our most likely scenario, we pass plus 2 degrees centigrade in 2050, so the Paris top Paris goal is violated already in 2050. And in our model system, we peak at around plus two and a half degrees centigrade at the end of the century, which is not global collapse, but very, very negative. You know, this is, that means that all the land ice is gone. It means that the sea level is, you know, 90 centimeters, three feet higher than it, it, it was in the past. It means that there are droughts, and it means that the productive areas are shifted to where people don't live, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it's really sad. It's something that should have been avoided, but in my mind, will not be avoided. My real problem with this is that the coral reefs for, for snorkelers 
are already gone, essentially, you know, which is uh, the first real biodiversity uh, catastrophe. Uh, and more will come, but we don't think this is going to lead to a total global uh, collapse. Uh, for those of you who love curves, I'll just show you what I just spoke about look like, but you're not. So you can then go into the, uh, the population sector and you can see the blue line, which is the decline in the number of children per woman. You see the red line, which is the total population, and you see the thin green line, which is the life expectancy. You know how people get, of course, rich, uh, live longer and longer in the model system because, of course, the GDP grows, because, which leads to a higher public services, more health, more education, and so you get the whole thing. If you want to look at the GDP part, you see this is the, the blue line is the, the total GDP, which passes the roughly $120 trillion per year, which is the current thing, and then doubles or trebles uh, during the rest of this century. This is, again, the value, and you must remember that one reason why the GDP is going to continue to grow is that there is as much GDP in ocean-going wind and CCS and renewable energy and in helping the poor rather than giving the money to the rich. So, you know, the GDP is totally uninteresting, you know, as when you want to discuss long-term uh, activities. You need to talk about people, workers, consumers, you know, physical things, and their physical impact. So it grows, and you see the red line the, the, with the big, the 10-year business cycles, the Marks growth cycles, the growth rate comes down from roughly, uh, what is it, 5% uh, a year at the beginning and down towards 1% uh, or 2% per year uh, at the end of this uh, thing. And uh, we then uh, come to question number four. So, will there be collapse? So, I made the trite observation that we have not had global collapse during the last 50 years. The interesting question, will we get global collapse during the next 50 years? And as I showed you in our too little, too late scenario, we don't get one. So, and if you then look into the possibility of a resource collapse, you know, us running out of coal, oil and gas, you know, it looks very unlikely at this point in time. Then you can ask the question, will accelerating CO2 emissions actually lead to a sudden collapse of the Amazonian forest or a sudden sea level rise because of Greenland you know, suddenly melting? If you do, we, and we spent many years on, on climate modeling uh, in our group, you know, these things will not happen in 10 years to 30 years. These are on 500 to 5,000 year horizons. So, in our mind, we will not get uh, environmentally induced collapse. Could the agricultural system collapse? Uh, and the answer is that yes, it can. But the, the ability of, <laughs> of fertilizer to shock and the overuse of food and the overproduction of food at this point in time is so vast that yes, you can a year or two or three and in, with horrible uh, hunger, and of course you can have regions which have sustained hunger, but you don't get a situation in our view where you, know, you get a food collapse uh, in the world. However, what you do get is the green line. Uh, and the green line is our well-being index. You know, that's where it, we really start now to hammer on the GDP people. You know, so you cannot and should not use GDP, the activity level of the economy, as a success measure. You should ask, you know, what is the well-being of the average working person? because it's the well-being of that person we're interested in doing something about, not the GDP. In the old days, GDP was useful because it was closely related to income, and since people were poor in this part of the world, you know, it was useful to use the GDP because when it grew, incomes grew. But 
in the current situation, it is the well-being of people. It is not only you know, what their disposable income after taxes, it is also how much support do they get from the government. It is also how much environmental pollution is there in the environment. It is also very important the level of inequality in society. Uh, and it is the final fifth component that we use in our well-being indicator, which is the green one. It is hope for the future. It's the progress, it's the participation thing. You know, do you go to China today and you ask the Chinese, you know, are you happy with the current situation? And they say, you know, two-thirds of them say yes. And then you ask the question, you know, uh, on a, or actually you should do it the following way. You ask on a scale from zero to ten, you know, uh, how happy are you? And then they answer six or seven or something like this. And then you ask, are you better off today than you were five years ago? And they say yes. And then you ask the really interesting question, five years in the future, what about that? Are you better, will you be better off five years in the future? And they ask, they answer yes. And so the important thing about society is to have a society where the majority of the people think that society is on its right way. It doesn't matter what that direction is, but if they have the feeling, this is well-being. And this is the way in which we have tried to summarize all these very soft uh, issues. So if there is progress in the direction of increasing the well-being, that, makes, that adds to the well-being. So when we calculate the well-being, you see it grew from 1980 up to 2010. This is, of course, a very, very rough average of the whole world, so it doesn't really mean anything in detail. But we had a general thing that during that period, incomes grew fast enough, you know, and pollution levels were not high enough to start bothering. In inequality was low initially, uh, and so it got worse. And so you see the thing peaks essentially now, you know, 2010, 2020. And then we are, according to our view, facing a situation where global well-being will be declining over the next 30 to 60 years, while the GDP is going up. You know, so there will be <laughs> the activity level will be high, the rich will be getting richer uh, fast, even the income component of people will go up, but the side effects will be overwhelming. So, uh, what we are then basically saying is that this decline in well being is the real problem of 2020, because this continuing decade after decade of problems not being solved by society or the global society will lead to social tension, stress, frustration, even possibly conflict at the local level. So we are basically saying, uh, as is then summarized, hopefully in this one, so unless there is extraordinary action, I forgot to say that, that the too little, too late scenario, one should say that this is what will happen unless there is truly extraordinary action. Built into the system are the decision mechanisms of the last 40 years, the way we make decisions at the individual, societal, company uh, level is built into that structure. So that leads to the problem. Of course, truly extraordinary action will help and can help. So, unless we have this, average well-being will decline towards 2050, and this lack of progress will cause tension and increase the risk of local social collapse. So we're basically saying that what we will see over the next 30 to 60 years is nations failing. And they're not failing because of environmental reasons necessarily, it's much more likely they fail because of unemployment, because of inequality, because of lack of hope. You know, you've, like the guys that flee you now from Ukraine and Afghanistan, where they just give up, you know, uh, trying to do something at home. Uh, Ukraine was not a good example, Afghanistan is better. Or Somali would be another one. Fine, question five. And now I'm getting to the perespen mode, so now I'm going to smile. So here is the solution. And it's very simple, and, and uh, 
how can we stop the decline in well-being? Because if we stop the decline in well-being, we avoid the social tension and the social conflict. And then uh, the first thing you have to do is, of course, to define the well-being index. I've already done this for you, but it's in the slides so that you know. So you have to get a little bit further on the beyond GDP discussion that has now been going on for 30 years. You know, modifying GDP to make it a welfare measure. No, it's not enough. You need to do something like this. And so we have chosen the five goals of what is called the well-being alliance of nations. And these are five or so na nations at this point in time that have chosen formally to change from GDP as the main measure to well-being being the main measure. So it's disposable income per person after tax, it's the government spending per person, it is the level of inequality, it's the observed global warming, and it's the perceived progress. So put equal weight on the five, and then you have a, a much, much more useful guide to, well -be to policy than if you're just using the value of the transactions during a year, you know, which is the GDP. Uh, and so, that's the first thing, so you need to have an indicator. And the second thing is that you need to eliminate the rising threats to well-being. And so what are the five things that need to be done? So we have had endless discussions, and the UN has had endless discussions. They ended up with 256 sustainable development goals, which is totally impractical, and particularly because it's also internally inconsistent, you know, it, it doesn't work. So we try to simplify this at least down to five things. Eliminate global poverty, stop climate change, halt biodiversity decline, stop population growth, which is the same as reducing the consumption pressure. There are still vast groups in the West that believe that the solution is voluntary individual consumption decline, which that's nice that someone thinks this. This is a systemic problem. This needs to be solved by the whole system. You cannot rely on individual sacrifice you know, in, a, in a system like this. But please continue to do so because it doesn't hurt. You know, it, uh, and then the final thing, reduce inequality. And to be then even more pedestrian and more smile, I've indicated to you how simple it is to do those uh, five things. So, how do you eliminate global poverty? That means, how do you do what Laila is doing, you know, international uh, development? You know, we have tried now for the last 50 years, you know, to, to get the South, you know, moved, uh, and uh, we don't succeed. However, we are in the lucky situation that the Chinese has managed to eight double the income of 1.4 billion Chinese in 40 years. So at least it can be done. Most people, of course, this is the second way in which I define myself out of the good company. I am a strong supporter of China and its attempt at increasing the well-being of the Chinese population. Most people only say Uyghur, Hong Kong, Spratly Islands. And it's impossible to get to an interesting debate about uh, alternative development methods and the, the Chinese model, you know, which is to make five-year plans, print the money that is necessary in order to implement those, give the money to the, the development banks that then orders the airports and the hospitals and the stuff, and then, since the plan is good, made by intelligent people in the party, it's consistent. You know, they do these five years again. They don't change their mind on the morning after a five-year plan has been, you know, clapped in. They start discussing the next five-year plan. And so these guys have shown that this is possible. But again, I, sorry for being the... Uh, so what I've been told by Prespen is at this point in time I should rather point to Costa Rica, because Costa Rica is also you know, doing a good job. It's, of course, on a scale which is not consequential for the rest of the world, but they like this much better. And also the deglobalization type of efforts that are going on, where you stop having free trade and rather try to, to have shorter uh, 
uh, the, the, uh, production chains. So more plan, less market. Stop climate change is totally simple. It's just to stop using coal, oil and gas. The burning of coal, oil and gas is 70% of all greenhouse gas emissions. If we stop using, producing and burning coal, oil and gas on a linear line from today to zero in 2050, you know, cutting 3% every year, that solves the whole problem. You can do it in the model system and everything is fine. No, that was not mine, I'm glad. So this is replace fossils with wind and sun. Increase energy efficiency, and here is interesting, from the model system, you need a huge amount of carbon capture and storage in order to keep the temperature down to plus two and a half degrees, uh, to keep the temperature below two degrees centigrade. Because most of the energy that is being used is heat. It has nothing to do with electricity. And you need for a long, long time to burn things in order to produce the heat, and you need, actually, because we have been stupid enough to make the population as big as, we, as it is, you need a lot of gas in order to do this. And this gas, if it is burnt without carbon capture and storage, we blow the climate. And so, although my movement, the environmental movement, you know, many thinking people in the, in the concerned sustainable development cons uh, areas, hate carbon capture and storage and sees it as a continuation of the fossil age, the message is that this is absolutely necessary if we're going to keep the temperature below plus two degrees centigrade. And then it will be really important in the ensuing several hundred years where we will hopefully try to draw the temperature back to the type of thing that was in the past. I don't think we're going to do it, but if we wanted to do it, Carbon capture and storage is necessary. Sorry for this long one. I do this simply in order to make myself politically totally unacceptable. You know, I'm in favor of population control, I'm in favor of China, and I'm in favor of carbon capture and storage. And I'm a 77-year-old environmentalist, science-based activist that has worked for such a long time. So I should be credible, but I am not because of these three basic beliefs. And I think all those three things are totally essential if we want to solve uh, the problem in time. Fine. How do you halt biodiversity decline? Very simple. You stop cutting the trees. And now, okay, now we have cut so many of the trees in the world that all the clear field areas, you know, you can continue for, for uh, production of, of wood. But it should be a dead sentence on, on cutting an old growth forest, you know, a biodiverse thing, whether it is in Hedmark or in, in, a, in the Amazonas. Uh, so that's the simple thing. You just need to change our agricultural ways so we do not expand into the forest, and we need to do uh, agriculture in a regenerative manner, which adds carbon into the soil instead of doing the, the modern way. This is doable. Uh, stop population growth, that luckily is the only thing we have done well during the last 50 years. This you do by uh, giving all women of the world education, health, contraception and opportunity. Because women that have all of these things available do not choose to have three children, and they don't even choose to have two children. We know that they end up, like Norway, having one and a half which is wonderful, you know, which is, you know... And then, of course, the final thing, it should, in many ways, have been at the top, but it's pedagogically much easier to talk about it going down. It is to re reduce inequality. And the only way to reduce inequality in a manner that actually matters is to make the rich pay for the higher well-being for the working majority. You know, so you simply increase taxes on the rich, and you use the money to fund the government so the government can provide health and education and contraception and opportunity and sun and wind and the whole schmear. And then I am getting to the end. I'm sorry if, if this ended up being too long. Uh, uh, 
you get you get to the end, and here I show. So if you implement this in the model system, look at the green line. You know you can create a future world where well-being increases. But of course, it does take those things. It is possible to achieve rising well-being during this century, but it will require strong collective action paid for by the rich by higher taxes or unconventional means. The unconventional means is a reference to the Chinese way of doing this, which is that the government just prints the money that is necessary, so they don't have to bother the Chinese with taxes. You know, as long as you do this in an organized manner, you don't get the inflation threat that, that people, rich people are worried about. Most people are not worried about inflation, because most people's salaries are inflation-proofed. So this is... This is a typical example of how the, the wealthy, the elite, has been able to form the institutions and the minds in such a way that we're stuck on the growth path. Uh, I am uh, essentially done, except that I couldn't resist this one. And then I'm done. So these are my personal conclusions after 50 years, and I'll read them slowly so that you get the time to think. The sustainability problem can be solved. Using existing technologies, you know, we already have the windmills and the solar panels and the contraception and the whole thing. It does not cost a lot. The cost of doing this is a few percent of global income, between two and four, according to most uh, uh, observers, which means that you need to move only two to four percent of the labor force from dirty jobs to clean, you know, from making fossil plants to making sun and wind. That's the type of big shift. But the needed action is not profitable from the point of view. So that's the reason why nothing happens, is that it isn't profitable from the market, from the investor point of view, to do the shift. So free markets will not deliver. So we need more regulation, more taxes, and more subsidies to make what the world needs profitable, as, and more profitable than the alternative. This is, it's difficult to gather democratic majority for such collective governmental action. This is to ask people to vote for parties that are for higher taxes, even higher taxes on the rich uh, is all you need, uh, and for more regulation, and most people don't want more, more taxes and more regulation, and consequently, you, Erasmus and others have a hard time. Uh, we won't succeed unless the solution is perceived as fair, which means paid for by the rich, minority. And the important point, and there I'll end, the rich, 10% richest people in the world control 50% of the income. We need you know, between 2 and 4% of total income to pay for the solution. We just ask those guys that already receive 50% of the income to pay to us but the 2 to 4%. So it's means increasing taxes on the rich by of the order of 5%. The income taxes of the rich would solve the whole problem. I'm very pleased that you have not fell asleep. I'm very happy that you have not, you know, at least expressed hate directly, uh, and at least allowed me to talk all the way through. Uh, I know that this is not doable, <laughs> but what else is there to do except trying? Because if I succeed at least a little bit, along with all the other people who are trying to push for, for the good thing, at least we get a little less bad future than we would otherwise have gone. And this is with a smile from Perespen. Thank you very much. It's always a pleasure to listen to you, and I can hear...